You ever ask for something that when you asked for it, you thought, well, this would be a great idea. It's kind of like the when the genie offers three wishes and the first wish is for more wishes. You wish for a thousand more wishes so you can keep wishing. And then you realize that what you ask for is more than you can handle or what you ask for is not going to be delivered the way you thought it would be delivered. You ask for something and realize that the package it comes in is more cumbersome than you thought it might be that the prize doesn't look like what you thought it would. I know many people in ministry, people who feel like they have a call on their life from God, who will regularly pray a prayer, something as simple as, well, I believe there's a song, and a line in the song is the prayer of many people in ministry. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Now, I don't know if you've ever read it. There's the, the seven deadly sins. There's the, the things that break the heart of God. There are seven things that God hates. And laced throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament, we get a fairly good glimpse at what those things might be. But then there's the every day in the hearts of men who are fallen in sin and women. More evil is conjured up. More things break the heart of God than broke the heart of God 5,000 years ago. It's true. There's more evil in the world today than there was five years ago. There was a nationally prominent individual who had been invited to speak on a very large platform for a very influential crowd of people. I know the names of some of the other people who have shared this stage with him in this particular arena, in the front of this group of influential people. And as he was preparing for that moment in a news interview, at a press conference, felt like then was the time to reveal that in his heart of hearts, he felt like it was perfectly okay for a grown man and a 13-year-old boy to engage in a sexual encounter. He thought that was normal. His view of the world, his heart, thinks not only is it normal, but it should be acceptable by anyone. In fact, it's discriminatory that it's not. In fact, we should change our laws to make it normal for grown men and 13-year-old boys to engage in sexual relationships. When you pray a prayer like, God, break my heart for what breaks yours, he begins to reveal places where his heart is being broken in the moment. He begins to reveal those things that many people can overlook. Wounding words that others might say, well, it wasn't talking to me. Oh, it wasn't about me. I, I, I don't care. And then we realize that if it breaks the heart of God and we've asked that he would break our heart for what breaks his, that we're no longer passive, idle bystanders. As we travel through this journey called life and we engage with other human beings and their heart is broken by word or deed, that ours will be as well because if it breaks the heart of a child of God, it breaks the heart of God. Have you ever asked God for something, a miracle, and simultaneously been terrified that he's actually going to give it to you? It's like praying for patience. You pray for patience, it's going to be tested. You pray for faith, it's going to be tested. When you pray for God to break your heart, it's going to be broken. And the reality is, as evil progresses... hearts are going to be broken even more. But don't give up hope. Because in the same way that blind Bartimaeus confronted the Messiah, and he had some names for the Messiah. He called him a couple of different names before he landed on his question. But then Jesus had one simple question for him. And he wasn't the only person he asked this question of. But this question is pertinent for us today. 
and I want you to think about this question. This is uh, Mark chapter 10. He said, they spent some time in Jericho as Jesus was leaving town, trailed by his disciples and a parade of people, a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, sitting along the roadside. When he heard that Jesus the Nazarene was passing by, he began to cry out, Son of David! Hey, Jesus! Mercy! Have mercy on me! Many tried to hush him up, but he yelled all the louder, Son of David! Mercy! Have mercy on me! Jesus stopped in his tracks. Call him over. They called him. It's your lucky day. Get up. He's calling you to come. Throwing off his coat, he was on his feet at once and came to Jesus. And Jesus said, What can I do for you? Break my heart for what breaks yours. Give me patience. Give me faith. Give me financial influence. Increase my bank account. Give me a better job. Provide me with the right spouse. How would you answer that question? If the king of the universe, the master of all things, the creator of everything living and dead, said to you, what do you want from me? What can I do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. In that very instant, he recovered his sight and followed Jesus down the road. Are you brave enough to step up face to face with the Messiah when he asks that question, what do you want? I want to see. I remember many, many years ago, it's been over 25 years ago, I prayed a prayer that I would be able to see the elements of the spiritual world, the angels and the demons. I wanted to know where they were. I wanted to know what they were up to. I wanted to be able to see them, whether with my physical eyes or my mind's eyes. That's a prayer I'll never pray again. It scared the bejeebers out of me. I literally fell on the floor crying in a fetal position. I won't be praying that one again anytime soon. I want to know. I want to understand. I want to see what God is up to. I want to see where hearts are broken, where ministry is possible, where hope can be added, where life and faith can come together in an intersection. That's what I want in this life. And every day God reveals to me another place where a heart is broken, where something is not the way it should be, where it's not what he wanted to be on earth as it is in heaven. And in many of those occasions, he challenges me to find the path, to build the bridge, to be an answer, even in my small little circle of influence, in my small, tiny little group of friends, in my daily conversations, how can I heal the wounds that he reveals? Over the last couple of weeks, if you've been watching, we've talked about how God said, what is that thing you got in your hand? Use what you already have at hand. Use what you're equipped with, what you're made with, what I gave you. Put that into play and do something with it. And then we talked about, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. And I revealed that there was a time that I said, I don't know why I'm not doing what you call me to do. And he said, because you hate you more than you love those that you're called to serve. And there's like eight questions in that. God, why do I hate me so much? How do I get past hating me? But then I can switch that and say, God, who are those that you've called me to serve? And why don't I love them the way that I should? How do I mend my heart to love those you've called me to serve? How do I change that comparison so the scale is tipped the other way? That I love those I've called to serve so much that it doesn't matter how much I hate me anymore. When all of those questions begin to come into play, the same one rests in the background. The king of the universe, the master creator of all things, is looking at me going, but what do you want? What do you want in all this? What do you want to happen? What do you want me to use you for? And as my heart continues to break for what breaks his, a new revelation every day, a new wounded spirit, I see women who are caught in the trap of divorce and abuse 
trying to decide which one is the worst option. Do I stay abused or do I get divorced? I see men who are caught up in sexual addiction and pride and arrogance, and they don't even realize, many of them, that the lifestyle they're living in front of their family is abusive to their children and to their spouse. They're so self-focused on their own problem, on their own addictions, on their own accomplishments, on their own successes, that they don't realize how much they've abandoned, pushed aside, neglected, or spoke negatively to and about their loved ones. And it breaks my heart. I picked up a book yesterday to deepen my own understanding. It's called Tears We Cannot Stop by Michael Eric Dyson. I have to be honest and say, I've never heard his name before I picked up this book. But when I talked to the people in Barnes & Noble, many people said he's very well known and he's very well loved and he can teach that thing or two. On the back, Stephen King himself has an endorsement that says, here's a sermon that's as fierce as it is lucid. It shook me up, but in a good way. This is how it works if you're black in America. This is what happens. This is how it feels. If you're black, you'll feel a spark of recognition in every page. If you're white, Dyson tells you what you need to know, what this white man needed to know at least. This is a major achievement. I read it and said amen. Stephen King. On page 23, yep, that's as far as I've gotten so far. Dyson says, you made her, Lord. You know what Mesha's little mind drifted into a faraway place. You know she, she sought to detect the pain she felt, but she was snatched back into a crude reality. It was a hell of a way for her to be introduced to the ugliness and nastiness that racism unleashes. But there is never a good time to be hated because of a small and insignificant thing like the color of your skin. There is never a good time to know that many white folk to know that for many white folk, your blackness makes you old Lucifer himself. There is never a good time to realize that your childhood is gone, that it has been rudely taken away by something as simple as a word, a word so stupid, nasty, filthy, little word. I don't think I need to repeat the word. But I'm going to share with you as I go through this book, because I know my friends in Pakistan, they suffer racism. My friends in Afghanistan, they suffer racism. My friends in the U.S. from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from South America, they suffer racism. And I believe from the Tower of Babel, when God scattered the languages of the people all over the earth, the enemy has been very well busy at the idea of creating a rift of hatred between people of different languages, cultures, races, sexes. God says, they will know you're my people by your love. And anything less than that tells a different story. Have you ever asked God for a miracle and simultaneously been terrified by the results? I have. And every day when I ask that question, God, what breaks your heart? He breaks my heart for something else. But in faith, I believe. When the son of Timaeus said, I want to see. And instantly the Messiah gave him sight. It was all rooted in one question. And I'm asking the question of you today. What do you want? If there's anything in this life you want more than Jesus Christ, get a good look at it. You're guaranteed to lose it. What do you want? I'm J. Lauren Norris, and you've been watching Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day.